<clears throat> Hello, everybody. Hey, uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to talk about some swimming issues today. Um, I call I'm calling them issues because if swimming were really simple, we would never have issues with swimming. We would just dive in and we'd be efficient and it would be a wonderful thing. We're going to the agenda for today, we're going to talk about center of buoyancy. We're going to talk about some rotation and timing. We're going to talk about the different phases. We're talking about some mistakes. Then we're talking about how to go faster. Um, obviously, all those factors you're either going to add to or take away from your swim, form, efficiency, time, that kind of stuff. Um, so improving any of those will help you go faster. But there are also some things relative to cadence and, and body position that are uh, critical and, and crucial. I'm going to turn on my screen sharing here for a second. I've got some pictures I want to show you. Um, so we'll um, maybe be flipping in and out on some of that, but there's some visuals that I want you to see on some of the positions, especially as the as I'm trying to describe them. There we go. So I think I have screen sharing on. Um, can you confirm that for me? that you can see my screen. Still loading. Yeah, so it's all black right now. There, there it, is. it is. Great. Okay, so this picture, we're gonna talk about center of buoyancy and the center of buoyancy is, is where I've got marked there uh, with that plus sign, maybe just a little lower um, depending on where you are at. But if you've got your arms reached way out, you're trying to lengthen that body from the you know, the center of mass, the center of buoyancy is going to be somewhere around that belly button, maybe just a little bit back from there. Um, if I'm going to adjust that a little bit, but it's going to be in the, the center where everything rotates around that point. So in this illustration, the, the rotation we're talking about is head going down and chest going up. So we're looking at uh, the body tipping forward and back relative to the bottom of the water, bottom of that space. We've got to think three dimensional because we're also looking at rotation. And so if we go into the middle of that body uh, longitudinally, so if we make a, a line from the uh, nose down through the, the tail there, uh, the body's gonna rotate around that same center of axis. So you've got a couple of different axes that are important. One is the uh, head going down, legs staying up, the center buoyancy staying level or flat in the water. And the other is a rotary point where the body's going to rotate around that point as it goes through. So that, that center of buoyancy is important. A lot of people think that they're a flat and level in the water. Uh, as you would get a, a snapshot or a picture of, uh, of each of us there, there are times when we're more flat, more uh, uh, in better position relative to our form. Usually as we get tired, we'll lift that head up, we'll uh, drop the feet. Um, some people will talk about, I can't get to that position because my legs are too heavy. And, and you know, a lot of, especially a lot of runners and cyclists who have very muscular legs, they'll use that. And I'll use, I'll say, use the word excuse or, or use the explanation that they can't keep their legs up because they're bottom heavy, so to speak. But a lot of that we're going to find out is relative to your head position, relative to what you're doing around that center buoyancy. Okay. So let's move on. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about the uh, rotation and timing of different things. So if you're flat in the water, even though you've got a good center buoyancy, so you're flat and level in the water and your shoulders are square to the bottom, you are slow. You're, you're not going to be moving very efficiently. There's a lot of extra drag, drag just because of the uh, breadth of your shoulders, the, the, the drag that you're creating. If you can get to a side, you'll be more... Uh, slick through the water. You have less surface area to help stuff through the water. So this top picture, it's illustrating that, you know, this guy is flat and level in the water, but he's on his side. He's uh, doing, and we'll talk later about the different phases, but he's, he's just reaching out. He's trying to lengthen and he's rotated to his side. And the, the second picture there, the middle picture with the, the green and the red, is trying to illustrate that he's still flat and level in the water, but you can tell Sorry, uh, so he's, his center of buoyancy is now flat level in the water relative to the bottom, but he's still rotated. You can see that the left shoulder, the one furthest away from you, is a little higher. His his arm is now down underneath. He's in this catch. He's, he's, he's in that pull phase. And then the bottom picture that we see there, I mean, he's finishing his stroke 
and we can see his you know, chest now because he's rotated all the way the other direction. So different spaces, different um, rotations that are going to happen around that longitudinal axis. And we want to stay off of being flat in the water where both shoulders and both hips are uh, equidistant to the bottom of the pool. We, want, we always want to have some sort of rotation uh, for as long as we can and avoid lengthened times where we're flat in the water. So rotation and timing. One of the things that happens that um, affects rotation and timing is that the uh, when you reach way out and you're in your entry phase and you're rotated to the side and you'll start your rotation down before you really get a good catch and pull. So you want to work on that catch and begin the pull when you're still rotated on your side so you can still be more slick, more streamlined in the water. And again, you're trying to avoid staying flat, um, tugboat type position. You're trying to be more of a speedboat position. So if you can imagine as you're trying to do work your strokes here in a little bit, we'll talk about the phases. You want to spend the majority of your time in a rotated position, not a flat position. Okay. That flat position that you're going to hit should be for a very short period of time as you're something going across that spot. We don't want to hesitate or pause in that spot. Now, most of us are not comfortable in the water on our sides. We're not comfortable in the water when we're um, in a rotated position because we're just flat out not comfortable enough in the water. And we'll spend more time when we're flat in the water, which is going to slow us down. We'll feel more comfortable, but we're not going to get any speed. And so this rotary um, rotation piece of it, what I really want to want you to get out of this, what I'm trying to beat into, into our thought process is that we want to be rotated the majority of the time that we're in the water. We want to spend very little time flat in the water. So let's look at the same thing from the front view. So the picture on the uh, on the left there is we're in our entry phase. This is the top picture on the one on the screen you just saw. The body's rotated. You know, I've got some numbers here, and that just happens to be where this person's at. And so it's almost 45 degrees uh, of rotation. Um, they're reaching out. They're trying to get that catch. They're uh, getting ready to start that pull. The picture on the right is now they're into that pull phase. And you see that the body is still rotated almost 30 degrees. So it stayed on its side for a really long time through that catch and pull. They haven't let the rotation come, come back down. Okay. The 120 degrees on the arm angle, angle, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, that's just, a, uh, uh, again, a, just a different number relative to arm. We'll talk about that as we get into the different phases. And some of us are going to have different angles based on some of our strength going on. But again, now looking from the front view, we're really looking at trying to stay on the side as long as you can. When you've done that entry phase, you know, 45 degrees is a, a decent place. This is hips and shoulders moving as a unit. So think about that center of uh, buoyancy rotating. You're trying to get your belly button to go 45 degrees, not just your shoulders, not just your hips, but get the whole body to rotate as a unit. It stays on that rotation for as long as you can. And you can see here is in the arm looks like it's a vertical position. We'll assume that's a vertical position and they're still at 30 degrees of rotation, okay? So the timing of the pull relative to the rotation, that efficiency, it's gonna help your speed, it's gonna reduce your drag, it's gonna make it feel easier perhaps because you're uh, slicing through the water uh, more efficiently. It's gonna be less strain, less stress on your shoulders. You're getting your hips and shoulders to move as a unit, which you're gonna be uh, less drag. And we've, se we've seen those from the side views and we've seen it from the front view. And as you are looking at your swims, you're trying to see, how, I'd love for you to try to see how long you can stay on your side as you're uh, grabbing that catch and that pull, okay? So this next piece, we're gonna start talking about the different phases. And we're just gonna uh, classify them here real quick. We've got the entry phase, the catch phase, the pull phase, and then the push phase. There is a recovery phase. I'm gonna talk less about the recovery phase because it's um, that hands out of the water, the arms out of the water, it's doing nothing to get you uh, faster. There are some things that I will talk about the uh, recovery phase uh, relative to your arms that you don't want to do just from an injury perspective, but there's a lot of 
conversation about where your hand should be outside the water, what your arm position should be like outside the water. Um, I'm going to tell you that I don't care as much about that uh, because it's not directly impacting your swim. These four phases I, uh, are more directly impacted on the swim. And I really believe if you take care of these four, your recovery phase of your swim will take care of itself. Okay. So the entry phase, we're looking at trying to have a streamlined position. So from the fingertips to the toes, trying to reach out as far as we can. You know, notice the body rotation where she's at. She's reaching out on that side. You can see that she's, uh, well, we'll imagine that she's trying to rotate the shoulders and hips closest to us to bring those up because she's reaching out with the left, with the right hand. And the left side is trying to rotate up and get into that speedboat position, that rotated position. So she's reaching out. The catch phase, you can see that arm is now starting to come down the uh, arm angle. You can see the elbow piece there. It's trying to get underneath of her body and uh, grabbing that catch. And look at her body position, how far she's on her side. Again, the previous slides, we're talking about that 45 degrees. As she gets into the pool phase, notice what the arm is doing. All the force is now trying to pull water backwards, not down. Trying to pull water backwards. And she, look, notice that she is still on her side in that pull phase. As she gets into the push phase, this is where the other arm is now entering the entry phase, if you will, as the arm that was just working is in the push phase. So their arms are really working opposite of each other, or um, it's not truly opposite, but they're doing different things, right? So as she's in the entry phase, that now she's uh, starting to reach out, rotate the opposite direction as she's pushing. You, her body position looks a little flat here, but that it, it, I don't think that's a an issue for uh, this because she's going to get off of that as she's rotating in the entry phase on the other side. Okay, so let's go through that again. Entry phase, trying to lengthen the body. This is uh, some people will call this the glide. Some people will you know simply talk about reaching out, lengthening the body, trying to be balanced around the center buoy. You know, that rotation is happening, trying to lift the opposite side, hips and shoulders up to get into that speedboat position or that rotated position. Uh, we talked earlier about 45 degrees as the catch begins, still in that rotated position. As the pool is pulling the water back behind, not going down, pulling back behind us, still rotated. And then as we finish the push phase, our body is now rotated down, trying to go to the other side and do just the same thing as the other arm is, is doing its work. Okay. Now, if we're, if we're really doing this well, as that arm comes out of the water, I don't care if your elbow gets straight. I don't care if you're doing fingertip drag. What it's doing outside, I'm going to tell you to be comfortable. Just get it back so that you can get to the entry phase with your body position being uh, balanced in the water, getting your rotation, and trying to lengthen your body for all of those. Okay? Let's move on. Now, couple of things I want to point out on this, um, uh, these phases or this piece of it here is the top one, I've got that circled, um, shoulders dropping. Okay. So we're going to look at where that shoulder is relative to the, the hand. I would love to see that uh, even though the, the body's rotated. So you can say, well, Paul, the body's rotated, that shoulder's going down, but not relative to the hand, right? Not relative to the, the arm. The bottom one is, is showing an even, uh, greater discrepancy where we're seeing the elbow now also is below the hand. When that happens, you know, the, the arrow on the far right that's pushing, that's uh, pointed down, that's where the pressure is going to go in the water. And when you put pressure down in the water, it's going to lift that hand up. It's going to lift that elbow up. It's going to lift that head up, which means you're going to rotate around the center of buoyancy like a teeter-totter. So your hips are going to go down and your legs are going to go down just because of where you're putting the pressure on the water relative to your center of buoyancy. Okay, so as you're doing this, as we're going back, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take us back one slide. So as we're doing this and, and we're looking at the entry phase, notice where that, that hand and elbow, I mean, it's, it looks pretty streamlined, right? We don't wanna put pressure down on the water. We wanna to try to get that uh, hand and wrist below the elbow so we can pull everything backwards as we enter the pull phase. Okay, can you see that? Yeah. So we'll go back. 
So now uh, illustrated here, if, if you, if somebody's putting pressure down on the water, if I push down, my body's going to go the other direction, right? If I pull back, my body's going to go the other direction. It's going to propel me further forward, which is really what we want to have happen. So that hand position, where it's at, where your shoulder's at, what your elbow's doing relative to your center of brilliancy is going to be a really big deal for helping your, your propulsion. Okay. Now I'm going to... Um, I'm going to show another slide. We'll come back to this here shortly, I think. Um, no, actually, I'm going to I'm going to move on. I'm, we'll come back to some of the other pieces, but I'm going to stop sharing this for a second and get our smiley faces back on here a little bit more. Okay, so let's talk a little bit now about the the basics. Okay, if you want to go faster in the water, say we're doing all these pieces, we want to go faster in the water. Whatever your stroke count is per length. If we can get less strokes per length, we're covering more distance per stroke. We're more efficient, which means we've got a better technique. The more we can work on that, the better. So we can look at these pictures and we can talk about the rotation. We can talk about those things. You get in the water, what I'd love for you to do or make sure that you're doing it is, what's your stroke count? 25 yards, 25 meters, 50, whatever it is. Going down the length of the pool, how many strokes does it take you to get down there? Let's say you're in a 25 yard and it takes you 20 strokes to get down there. Right, left, right, left, right, left, 20 strokes. That means 10 each hour. You can do the math. How much distance per stroke did you have? If you keep the same cadence and the next time you go 18 strokes down there, right, left, right, left, that's nine per obviously you're covering more distance with each stroke, okay? You're getting more efficient, pulling through the water, covering more ground, okay? Let's talk about running. If we're gonna run and I have a really short stride, I'm only covering a certain amount of ground, I've gotta take a lot of steps to get a certain distance. If I have a longer stride and we're assume everything's efficient and we're good mechanics, then two of us going together with the same cadence, one has a longer stride, one has a shorter stride, which one's going to be faster? The one with the longer stride. If you're covering more distance per stroke, if it takes you less strokes to get the length of the pool, you're more efficient. You should be faster in the water than somebody who's not covering as much. Covers as much distance per stroke. Okay? So I, I look at distance per stroke to see how efficient you are in the water. Once you've got that done, done and you've brought that down, I'm going to make up a number here. Let's, let's take it down to eight strokes in armor. You've got, it takes you 16 strokes to get to length of the pool. Great. You've got decent efficiency. We can always get better, right? But we've got decent efficiency. Now we've got to add fitness on top of that, and we're going to increase your cadence. And so if you're covering the same amount of distance, but you're doing it faster, now you're going to go even faster. And that... You get wore out because you're. It's harder, and a lot of people don't like getting out of breath in the water. They like going one pace. We can go out on the, on the track and we can run different paces. We'll hit the different energy systems. But a lot of us, we get in the water and we have one gear. We can affect those gears by being more efficient in the water, cover more distance per stroke, and and working on that, being intentional. And we can do that by having different cadences. Both those will give us a different effect and. Uh, will affect our, our fitness, if you will, as you're doing those pieces. So if you want to get faster in the water, the first thing I, I would tell you is to get more efficient. A way of measuring your efficiency in the water is how many strokes does it take to, for you to get from one end of the pool to the other? Your job is to minimize the stroke count per length. Once you've got it to a, a stroke count per length that you're comfortable with and that you're happy with and, and demonstrates good efficiency, to add fitness on that, you do that same thing faster. Well, how do you do that? You got to pull harder. You got to make it go through the water faster. A lot of people will do that and they'll drop an elbow or they'll become less efficient. They're not covering the same amount of distance per stroke. They're just having a higher cadence. So when we get to the place where we're going to talk about having a higher cadence, I want you to, to obviously do that but I don't want you to do that while sacrificing your distance per stroke or sacrificing 
uh, your form and efficiency, you're going to get hurt. Okay. So what are some basics on how to be streamlined in the water? As you get that entry phase, I want you to lengthen that body. I want you to reach out. I want you to have a glide phase where you're trying to lengthen um, from your fingertips to your toes and, and really separate that distance. See how tall you can reach up. A way to imagine this on dry land is if you stood next to a wall and you stood flat to it, both shoulders are square to that wall, and you reach up, you're going to get a certain height. If you want to get higher, you want to get higher, you rotate into that wall. You rotate into that wall so that you can reach up higher. That's what you're doing in the water. So you've come in, I can stay flat and that's the side I'm gonna get, or I can rotate into it and I'm gonna get a little longer. I'm gonna reach up a little higher in the water. Maybe that's a, a, a something to imagine as you're doing an entry phase or you're in that glide space or in that lengthening your body. But getting that long streamlined position is important. Your head and neck position should be looking at the bottom of the pool. We're, we're going to see here shortly that your, your head angle, if you're looking ahead, you're trying to see where the wall's at, or you're trying to see the T um, at the bottom of the pool, your head is up. When your eyes are up, your head is up. If your head pops up at all, your feet are going to go down. That's just like putting pr downward pressure on, on, the, um, on the water where your hand elevates. When your head goes up, your feet are going to do the opposite. Uh, which is going to be going down. They're going to drag and you're going to get slower. So trying to make sure that neck, that head and neck is in a streamlined position, that you're not up, that you're looking maybe about 25, 30 degrees in front of you. Okay. So if, uh, I'm going to, if we're on the side here and I'm looking straight out, okay, and I'm on the horizon, that's zero. I want to be maybe looking at about 30 degrees up. Okay. So imagine I'm, I'm length, pool bottoms right here. I'm laying down. I don't want to look at the very bottom. I also don't want to be looking up here. That's going to take my head and neck and lift it up, put my feet up, feet down. I want to be at about 25 to 30 degrees in front of me. Okay. Now, when I reach up, I want you to watch this part of my arm. When I reach up, my, we talk about not crossing over and not getting too wide. If I reach straight up, look at the distance between my head, my, my ear and my arm. Okay. I'm trying to get that up. And if I reach way up there, look what happens. Uh, I'm reaching, I'm lengthening. My head doesn't go into it. My arm goes up to my head. Try, again, trying to be streamlined in that position. Okay. So as you're reaching out there, make sure your head's not tipping to the side, that you're elevating your shoulder blade. You're reaching as far as you can. Think about perhaps that you're rotating into a wall. Uh, as, as though you're all leaning up against the wall and you're actually trying to get taller, you're trying to reach up higher than somebody else that does in that, in that situation, okay? As you start your catch, I want you to think about, so it, it's way up here. I want you to think about, imagine my, my arm here. I'm trying to get my hand and my elbow vertical as quick as I can, okay? So I, I come up. I, I don't want to just kind of gradually let it come down here and then I'm going to pull back. I want to get it up. And, and sometimes I'm going to bring it down here where you can see a little better. But if this is my arm up here, I'm trying to get my wrist down as quick as I can. So I'm trying to get that motion right there to happen. I go up. I'm trying to get that to happen up here. I'm trying to get a catch as quick as I can. We turn this sideways my, and we imagine being vertical. My fingers are always underneath my elbow. Okay, so we're looking at the water, water bottoms right here. So we're, we're up and we're trying to get to that catch position as fast as we can. Hand, wrist, directly under the elbow. Once we've got that position, now we get into the pool and we're trying to get all that to, to pull back. A lot of people don't think about their lats. They don't think about their shoulder blades and they just try to, to pull through. And if you pull through, the easiest way to do that is to drop your elbow because there's not as much resistance. Keeping that nice and flat against the water. So as I pull down and I got all this surface area pushing on the water, it's a little harder, you gotta be stronger, you gotta work into that, but you'll get more pressure on the water, which is gonna propel you further forward, okay? So take home messages on that. In your entry, you're trying to reach way up, get way up there, stay streamlined, keep your head and neck in the right position. You're trying to get to a vertical forearm as quick as you can. Imagining I'm, you know, right now the water is, uh, you're the water if you're looking at me in this situation, you're about to pull, try to get vertical. And then as I pull through here, Watch this. 
that shoulder blade, I can get it to engage as I initiate the pull with my left. If you're on your side, if you're in that rotated position, you've got a chance to use your lats. You've got a chance to use your lats. If you've rotated and you're flat, the lats might work, but it's really harder to get them engaged. So if you're on your side, if I'm reached out, I'm in this position and I'm reaching down and I'm pulling here, I'm more likely to get my lats engaged, the big muscles here that are gonna help pull you through that are more efficient, that can last a lot longer than the little muscles. If you're rotating on your side, the more likely you are for those to happen, to, to stay engaged, to help pull through, okay? The pull. So we're here to catch with a pull. Now, I don't really care whether your arm, and I'm, I'm gonna to try to demonstrate it here. So imagine again that we're different, we're looking at my elbow angle. I don't care if your elbow angle is here or here, okay? I don't really care about that angle. If it's here, it's gonna be closer to my body. If it's out here, it's gonna be further from my body. Now, out here is where I would tell us, you know, try to get to. We might be, we might have to pull it in a little bit because we're not strong enough yet for that position. Okay, so think about if you're going to try and get try to get out of the pool. If I push straight down from here, I'm more likely to get out of the pool than if I stuck my arms out on the side of the pool and push myself up. Okay, so this becomes a strength issue relative to you. So we've reached out, we've got the catch, the angle of my elbow, I can bring it in, makes it easier to pull all the way through, or I can leave it out here to pull all the way through, okay? Out here's harder. I get more surface, I get more um, force on the water, but if I'm not strong, I'm not gonna be able to do that, okay? So you can work into different elbow positions. And we saw on the one uh, slide that they had a, a measurement of 120 degrees for the elbow and so forth. And we look at the elbow position, you know, I'm gonna call that 120 degrees um, versus 90 degrees versus 60 degrees versus all the way out. I don't want you all the way out. Now, I want some sort of bend in that elbow just to help protect all the structures in your shoulder. Okay, so we've just talked about the pull. The pull, the pull starts at the catch and really ends about 90 degrees of your shoulders. Then it turns into a push. Then it turns into a push. You still want your forearm vertical to the, um, the bottom, to the floor as you're pushing straight backwards, but a lot of people will stop before they finish the push. The pull and the push are all part of the stroke. They're all part of that um, space, but think about a pull and then a push to finish it off and your, your push, you'll end up with your hand going down near your thigh. There's plenty of drills where you're, you're you know doing a zipper drill or you're trying to touch your thigh or you're finishing the stroke. Some people talk about flipping water, all those different things, but that's a push in that tricep to work and those lats to finish off you know, finishing it. And there's a lot of people who miss that piece of the stroke. That's an important piece. There's a lot of power that can be used in there. Okay. Now, if your body stays flat, that's a lot of work to fit it, to do a push. If you're rotating from the hips, if you're rotating at the appropriate timing, it's not as stressful. It's not nearly as hard as if you're not rotating. So if you're doing that rotation and, and or doing that, that push piece of it, and you're getting exhausted, the first place I'd have you look at is are you truly rotating? Is your timing where it needs to be? Or are you simply trying to overcome some inertia and you're working really hard? Okay. Again, it's a sequence of things. You know, certain, you know, want your bigger muscles to work first and then you kind of get into um, uh, the whipping action as you're finishing that, that stroke. Okay. That makes sense so far? Yes. So you're going to get a lot of work. Yes. So you got your, Elevating the shoulder girdle, you're getting a streamlined position. You think about it, you got your catch, you're getting that vertical forearm. You start initiating that shoulder blade to start the process. Your lats engage, you're still on your side. You're entering the push phase. That's when you come across back onto a you know, flat position in the water, but you're not going to linger very long because you're pushing off. And then, and then work on an entry on the other side where you're on uh, a big rotation as you're reaching out and going to repeat the same thing on that side. The entire time, your body's in a streamlined position, rotating along the X, the, the long axis of the body. Um, and if we're doing that, we're efficient. If we're doing that, we're going to uh, have a lower stroke count. If we stay efficient in that and we add a cadence to that or we increase the cadence from, I'm going to make up numbers for you. Uh, if you're taking uh, 45 strokes 
uh, per minute, and you move that to 50, 55, 60, 70 strokes per minute, you're going to be going a lot faster as long as you don't lose your form and efficiency. Okay. So stroke rate, what should that be? Well, frankly, it really depends on what, what uh, your fitness level is, what your efficiency is, and how long the race you're doing. If we're doing a 25 yard sprint, man, I want that thing, I want you flipping those arms, I want you to be that big propeller and just get them through there. If you're doing a, a 2.4 mile swim, you probably ought to slow that cadence down and just work on efficiency and getting through. So um, it's appropriate that in your training, you're working on both of those, a higher cadence, a lower cadence. But when you're doing that, make sure that you're not sacrificing your distance per stroke or you're not losing that, that, that distance per stroke. You're not losing that efficiency. You're not causing undue stress on your body, uh, making yourself work harder just to work harder. Okay. Now, now that we've talked through all that, swim speed is really simple. What's your stroke rate? Multiply that times your distance per stroke. Very similar to running. Running speed is stride length times your cadence. Swim speed is distance per stroke times your stroke rate. The more distance you cover, the higher your cadence, the faster you're going to be. A lot of people try to go there and, and, and sprint when they're, you know, when I start coaching somebody, they'll come in and they'll be like, running is so hard. And I'll be like, what are you doing? And they'll talk about how fast they want to go. Well, you can't go, you got to go slow before you go fast. You got to work on the technique. You got to work on the fitness before you go fast. Same thing in the water. A lot of people get in and they start spinning and they're they're not breathing appropriately. We haven't even talked about breathing. And, and, and for this session, we'll, we'll, we're will we going to skip breathing. We're going to assume everybody's breathing really well. But but they're holding their breath and they, they get out of gas because you do. You're not getting your hair in. Um, get, get your distance per stroke, get your efficiency, get all that stuff to happen, and then add your fitness, which in essence becomes your cadence, okay? Okay, so let's talk about the different gears. You know, some, some, of, some of us, we get in the water, and we talked earlier that we've got one speed. We go the same pace, whether we're doing a 25, whether we're doing a, a 250, whether we're doing a race, we got one speed, we got one gear. I want you to try something. You know, in the coaching stuff, I mean, you've got different um, descriptions of pacing and intensity that are given to you. Try it. I dare you, try it. Here's what's going to happen the first time you do it. You're not going to like it. You're going to get in there and you're going to get out of breath and you're not going to be impressed by your time. And you're not going to be impressed by how you feel. It's going to feel really sucky, more intense. Your time will probably go down. When you try to go faster in the water, your time generally falters if, if you don't stay relaxed and efficient in the water. Relaxed mean, mean, meaning that you're not working on your form, you're not efficient, you're not doing those sorts of things, you're fighting the water. When you try to go faster with your cadence, most people will go slower because they lost efficiency. So get in there, try, see what happens to you. My, my challenge to you is if, if you get in there and you've got this one speed and you're used to doing this and you're comfortable with it, get uncomfortable, see what happens. Some people, when they're running, don't like to do 800 meter repeats. They're comfortable with 400 meter repeats. Some people don't want to do any 400 meter repeats because they're more comfortable with one mile repeats different pacing, different intensity. It's what they're used to. Get them comfortable in the water and on the on land. One quick thing about breathing, uh, when we're out on land, if we don't breathe at the right time, it doesn't matter. We don't get punished. I can run, I can get out of breath. I just, I can breathe anytime I want. Swimming, <laughs> if I miss my timing, if I don't breathe and I breathe the wrong time, I'm going to get punished. I inhale some water. I get it up my nose, and I cough on it, I get punished. So that gets scary. That gets uh, becomes a challenge for us of um, how hard we want to work. We don't want that to happen. Risk it. 
the pool's not that deep. You're not going to drown. Okay. Uh, some of the pools uh, that, that are deeper, you've got lifeguards. They'll come get you. Um, don't get yourself in trouble. <laughs> don't. I'm not asking you to do anything that's unsafe. But push yourself a little bit. Get out of breath on some of these things without losing your form, without losing your technique. Okay. I'm going to pause just for a second. Any questions so far? Um, questions, suggestions. Uh, the breathing part probably practice that on land, like <laughs> before you swallow that water. Um, the um, questions when you're talking about the uh, buoyancy um, and the rotation and stuff from what I deal with my current clients is like low back and shoulder issues. If that form is off, can that contribute to a lot of those particular situations that's making those reoccurring? You talk about overuse injuries? Yeah, like um, if the angle of the arm is off and not using the lat properly, they're using more of the shoulder muscles, uh, smaller muscles on top of an unstable shoulder um, can be challenging with that. So, Yeah, me mechanics mechanics will play a big role in, in injury, uh, for sure. Right. When you say unstable shoulder, I instantly go, don't swim if you've got an unstable shoulder without getting uh, all those things there. But if, you, if it's simply a mechanical issue where you've got the timing poor or you're putting too much strain on the rotator cuff when it should be on the lats or other parts of it, then um, becoming more efficient will help that. And that's always my big thing too. Is if it's unstable shoulder, strengthen it before you start swimming. Um, now, with that rotation for on land exercises, would it be best to train to resist the rotation? So when we go to call on the rotation, it would be stronger. Uh, sometimes it. Well, sure. Yeah. Anytime we want to get stronger, we got to resist whatever motion we're doing. A lot of people don't know how to roll on the ground, right? So if we go on the ground and try to get somebody to move, they can't rotate without touching the ground with a hand or a foot or an elbow to push themselves in rotation. So if they can't do it on land, they're not going to do it in water where it's an unstable surface. So part of right. it is simply learning you know, how to move hips and shoulders at the same time so you can rotate the body as a unit. Um, you know, Once you can figure out how to get the motor firing sequence to be able to, to rotate that way, then building the resistance, building resistance to that, making that stronger, more powerful would be a good idea as well. But I would always have people look, you know, that's part of what we do in some of the classes, right? We, we Some of the planks that we're doing, we're talking about hips and shoulders rotating at the same time. And, and I'll see an elbow rotate or a, a shoulder rotate, the elbow pops off first, and then they get their elbow or their shoulders rotated about 45 degrees. And then they'll push with their hips to get those up because they their segmental motion versus block motion. And in the water, you can be efficient. You can't have the segmental motion um, and be efficient and stay, and stay streamlined. Oh, okay. I'm on mark. Okay. Well, let's talk real quick um, uh, uh, common mistakes. We, we've already mentioned a couple of them. One was that shoulder drop, that, that uh, the elbow drop uh, at, at no time to, through this um, swim form technique should your elbow ever be below your hand. You always want the hand under the elbow as much as you can. Yeah, you know, no, let me rephrase it. You always want your hand under your elbow, period. Now, the quicker you get it vertical, to get that your shin uh, parallel to the floor, uh, perpendicular floor, get that forearm vertical, the quicker that happens, the better, but you never want to have an elbow that's below the hand. That's you're slicing through the water. You're not getting any good grip. Um, you might have a great cadence doing it that way, but you're not propelling your body anywhere because of that. Another issue is the rotation, either staying flat in the water and just being a propeller. Um, your body, your shoulders never do the rotation. You just get those arms moving really fast. Um, now you're a tugboat. You can um, make that uh, propeller move as fast as you want, but it's you're still pushing against the water. The timing of that rotation, the timing of the stroke relative to the rotation, make sure you're paying attention to it. Um, 
we showed earlier that if you, you want to stay on the side, you want to be rotated for as long as you can. And then very briefly, are you truly flat in the water, but you're rotating across that point into the next stroke, trying to get to a rotation there as well. And then the last place that I, I tend to see um, drag come up that we haven't talked a lot about yet is the kick. They'll, they're trying to stay balanced in the water and they'll kick their legs. They'll, they'll have a big wide scissor kick with their legs because they're trying to push into the water or push down on the water um, to keep the body level. That kick should stay in a, uh, basically in the same tube as what the, the body is. They don't want to, you don't want to kick outside. You don't have a big scissor kick. When you, when you go to rotate one side versus the other, sometimes I'll see one leg will push more or scissor more on that side. And that's usually an indicator that they're not able to rotate, that they've got a core issue, that they've got a motor firing sequence issue in, in, that, in that swim. When you start scissoring on one leg, or if you're scissoring on both, then you just can't rotate either side. But that if, if you are looking at yourself and, and you have some video of yourself, those are some quick, easy things for you to look at is what is your kick doing as you're rotating? How long are you staying on your side during your stroke? Now, those are some, and then where's your uh, elbow relative to your hand and wrist? Those are some quick, easy places to look at. Some low-hanging fruit for most people's efficiency, okay? Fourth thing, when, this is a reminder we talked about earlier, is where are you looking in the water? When you're looking, when you're swimming, where are your eyes? If you notice that your eyes are trying to look forward, trying to look toward the end of the pool, your head's going to be up. There, there's no way that you are in a good position and, and staying balanced there if your eyes are looking at the other end of the pool. So sometimes just some reminders there. Hey, Gus. Hey, uh, quick question on kicking. So we'd just be interested in your experience if you've seen, I don't know if the word's inefficient kicking, but I, I swam two years in high school and I got progressively faster throughout those two years. However, I, I noticed pretty quickly when we would do, say, like kickboard exercises, so just to work the legs, I couldn't move myself to save to, to, for the life of me. Um, I felt like I had a pretty efficient overall stroke. Like I said, got faster. But anytime it was just the legs, I wasn't moving and would be interested if you've seen that previously and if maybe that's, I guess I used to think I just have bony legs that cut through the water and don't provide enough, uh, you know, space, but I don't think that's the case. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some other things going on, but would, you know, would be yeah. interested to know if you've seen that kind of stuff before. Yeah. So, so let me tell a quick story. I had one, um, one new client come in and we were doing some kicking drills and um, I'm actually watching him in the pool, put him on a kickboard and he starts kicking and he goes backwards he literally went backwards when he started kicking. Um, his position of his feet, the position of thing. I mean, think about, I mean, if you look at sculling, a sculling drill with your hands and it doesn't take very much motion. You're just kind of doing this with your hands and you're going to creep forward. He was kicking and his feet were basically sculling and it was pulling him backwards. And so there's, you know, I, I'm looking at that and I'm, I'm almost in disbelief that he's kicking and he's going backwards. And it took me a little while to actually figure out what was going on with him. But yeah, kicking, you know, there, there are a lot of inefficient uh, kickers out there. The position of your foot, how much your knee is bending, you know, if you're just you know, kicking from the knee because that feels more comfortable and you're used to doing that and you're used to your quads and hamstrings, there's not a whole lot that's going to happen in terms of pro propulsion just by doing that. Getting the, the, the kick to happen through the hips, whereas you're um, and, and again, we can get into six beat kick, two beat kick, or uh, are you using your legs? Um, to truly propel you if you're a quote a traditional swimmer or if you're doing a triathlon swim where you're not going to kick as much um, of, of what the benefit of that kick is going to be but the uh, more you can get the hips involved get the leg to have a, a little uh, whipping action so knees and ankles here and, and then hips we want this all to happen but we also need some sort of whipping action going up and down as that's happening, right? So it's a, a whipping sort of action or a, um, they're not gonna be rigid and straight and, and doing this, that's not gonna last very long. So it's it's developing that side. It's really hard to give a specific on that without seeing a, um, 
truly what's going on because it could be just like the example I was talking about could simply be the the feeder in the wrong position and he's sculling or you're sculling it's kind of pulling you back or slowing you down you're getting some positive effect you're getting some negative effect and then the net gain is that you're not going anywhere yeah that makes sense and then that's helpful thank you and after I asked it I realized I also missed the first 15 minutes so I'll, I'll go back and check the recording to see if uh Maybe I missed some stuff as well earlier on. We didn't. You did great. We didn't miss anything about the kick at that uh, in that early. Okay. Yeah. Um, but great question, Gus. And, and uh, the questions so far about efficiency, we can. I'm trying to give you things for you to try to feel when you're in the water. And swimming is, you know, if we're going to uh, get faster on a run, I'm going to tell you to go work harder, right? When we go work hard in the run, we go work hard on the bike. When we get faster in the water, you got to relax. You got to work on your efficiency. You go work hard in the water, you're going to go backwards. You're not going to go faster. You're just going to work hard to get out of breath. And so it's sometimes counterintuitive to just, hey, relax, work on technique, and you'll get faster just by working on technique. It's hard, though, to, to know if you're truly in the right position. I'm giving you some things to try to feel, try to see that, but it's really hard to see what your body's doing. You might think it's in a position and it's really not. So video, video is an important thing. Sometimes having, uh, if you're swimming next to somebody and, and you know they're familiar and with you and you're familiar with them, somebody can say, hey, what'd that look like? And they can give you some feedback about your position and maybe you can ask them spe some specific questions for what you're looking for or what the, the angle of X was or uh, how long you stayed on your rotation and get some observational feedback there. Video, however, you can break it down all kinds of things, all kinds of ways. There are two perspectives that I would tell you if you're going to do video. There are two perspect perspectives that you need to see. You need to see yourself from the side, and then you need to see, see yourself swimming into the, the shot or from front on. Just like the pictures that we showed earlier, you're looking at the side position. So you can see from toes to fingertips all that way so if you've got a, a gopro you put it on the end of the stick maybe you're holding it next to the pool and, and uh, or have somebody hold it next to the pool and walking with you as you're going and you're swimming away from the wall against that lane line give yourself a little distance so that the the, the viewing area of the, the lens is going to capture your entire body and then they would walk next to you you'd, you'd see it from that uh, that viewpoint underwater you, you capture it you download it you look at it and then you see if, if what you feel is the same as what you see. Hey, I felt like I was on my side, but as you look at it, you know, there's very little time that you're on your side. Um, if you're not sure what you're looking at, you want some help with that. I mean, we can talk about uh, video analysis, that sort of thing. We, I've got some software that we can actually put numbers to things and look at angles and look at timing and, and all that sort of thing and, and go through those things to, to dive a little deeper. I would tell you that before we do that, I'd want you to look at, you know, what are you doing? You know, do what you can on your own to, to get an understanding of what your swim lot, swim looks like, what you are doing, what you're doing well, what you think you're struggling with, and then let's talk about it, okay? Um, I don't want to tell you that I, I don't want to do your video, but I don't want to just look at a video and then not really have a, a benefit that you can truly apply. And the more you know about where, where you're at when you're coming in, the better off you're going to be. Okay. Swimming's hard. Unless you've been swimming for a really long time, you try to pick it up um, later in life. It's really hard. It's complex. If you're having trouble with your hand position, rotation, take your legs out of it. Use a pool boy. And then just focus on the rotation and the upper body without worrying about the kick. If you're having trouble with the breathing, you can't get the timing down. What should you do? Snorkel. Don't worry about the rotation. Just leave your head in one position and breathe anytime you want because you got a snorkel on. Get the, get the mechanics down. Now, I don't want you swimming with a pool boy all the time, and I don't want you swimming with a snorkel all the time, but they can be some great tools to help you work on these details as you're working on the form the technique of learning to swim. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, so far we've talked about pool swimming. In the background of my image right now, we've got a little uh, open water swim going on right there. You don't get a lane line. You don't get to look down you're gonna be more likely to be uncomfortable and try to look up above the water. What's gonna to happen to your efficiency? It's gonna go down. How many times 
have I heard, I don't, and I don't know the number either, and you certainly don't know the number, how many times I've been asked this, but when you go out and swim in the pool, you go a certain pace, you go open water, and it's not the same pace. You didn't lose fitness. You most likely to lose some efficiency or distance per stroke uh, because of something that's going on with your body position or your comfort level or something with your stroke. Now, we've got some people who do a lot of open water swimming, who love open water swimming, the long stuff. That is fantastic. They're more comfortable with it. Some of us don't like getting in the open water because we can't see the bottom. We're nervous about what might be down there. We're not comfortable in our swim. We're not confident in ourselves in that form of technique. We're worried about what might happen. Okay. There's only a couple of ways to get better at that. One of them includes practice. Okay. That's all I have for you guys relative to swim. I hope this is something that will, uh, as you look at this or review this, uh, and you have uh, areas of your swim technique that you can work on, this is something that can be helpful. Certainly, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out um, here at PXP Endurance. Stop in, uh, shoot us a text, shoot us an email. Uh, we'd love to help you with your swim.